This week on The Aviators, ever wondered how to do a helicopter pre-flight? We find out as we look at the TH-57 Sea Ranger. Sarah shows us Mitsubishi's contribution to the general aviation turboprop market, the MU-2. And we go inside the Wisconsin Air National Guard as they do a flyover at Road America. For more than 40 years, the Bell 206 has been one of the most commonly used helicopters on the planet. The U.S. Navy calls the aircraft the TH-57 Sea Ranger and uses it to train the next generation of helicopter pilots. When we first started out in Pensacola, I was in T-34s, they're now T-6s, so uh, I guess I'm getting old enough where they're starting to retire my airframes. Lieutenant Commander Joe Parker is a TH-57 instructor with Helicopter Training Squadron 8. Every Navy, Marine, or uh, Coast Guard pilot begins single engine fixed wing, and they take you through, through a progression, uh, instruments, solos, and a short form syllabus of precision aerobatics. Uh, and all that takes uh, anywhere from um, six to 12 months. And once you finish that first phase called primary, they determine uh, what your next step is gonna be. If you're gonna be a jet guy, uh, prop guy, or helo guy. Um, I selected helicopters and uh, it wound up being a great fit for me. I've really enjoyed the last 10 years of flying. As they learn the basics of flying in fixed-wing aircraft, it goes without saying that there are some similarities the Navy students will see between the TH-57 and their earlier trainers. But as with any aircraft, there are different procedures for every aircraft's walk-around and pre-flight inspection. And of course, a helicopter pre-flight is a whole new experience that student helo pilots have to learn. So the first thing you want to do when you walk up to the aircraft is come straight on at a distance, check underneath for uh, security and uh, check all your antennas and make sure that the shape and uh, especially your skids, make sure nothing's bent or broken or, you know, it looks the way it's supposed to look. Then you walk straight on the aircraft, integrity of the windscreen, uh, check your uh, OAT gauge up top and then open up the uh, battery access panel. Checking your battery um, and for events and security. And then uh, you hook your battery up. When you open or close the panel, you want to treat it like you're the last person that's ever going to touch it before you go fly. Now, cyclic, collective, checking all your gauges and instruments, making sure they uh, read what, what you want them to read. Come in here, kick the battery on, check your fuel load out, and then uh, your torque and your TOT gauges, make sure uh, no limits were exceeded uh, prior to going to fly the aircraft. Open up here, you can get a good look at our hydraulics bay. And these are all the hydraulic systems that assist in moving the control surfaces of the aircraft. This is our uh, 420 uh, shaft horsepower Allison gas turbine engine, which makes the whole thing go. Fuel tank holds 91 gallons, and uh, we can stay airborne for about two hours and 45 minutes. All right. This is the stabilator. You'll notice it has negative camber. It's a wing upside down, because in order to keep this thing level in forward flight, you need to have some downdraft on this. Otherwise, the nose at higher air speeds would want to constantly pitch forward. As you get forward air speeds, this acts as a stabilizer to keep the aircraft pointed in, in the right direction, or the direction you want it to go into. This is your basic two-bladed tail rotor system. Again, you want to check and make sure the whole system has all that flexibility in play. Uh, that you were checking earlier. And another integrity check of the hydraulic system. Standard Navy safety policy. Anytime uh, your feet break the deck or leave the ground, you need to have some protective headgear on. This is the main rotor mast. That's, the blades are actually hung from the top of the mast uh, with the semi-rigid system. These are pitch change rods, or control tubes, as some people call them. And what they do is, when you move the cyclic, these move in equal and opposite directions, causing to change the angles of the blades. When 
you move the collective to go up or down, you actually move the entire rotating swash plate. You're making sure there's no dents or dimples or wrinkles or anything that might indicate the structural integrity of the blade has been compromised. After the pre-flight is completed, the pilot and co-pilot put on their standard Navy survival gear. It's a pain in the butt, but when you need it, you're glad you have it. Then after running through oh. a quick checklist, starting the engine, and doing a quick run-up, it's off they go to fly their mission. About five years ago, my dad asked me why, uh, why I don't go ahead and go to law school. And I told him, I said, I can go to law school anytime I want. I can only be a, a Navy pilot. I've got a finite window. I've got a small amount of time. And uh, as long as they keep giving me these jobs that are challenging and interesting and fulfilling, then, uh, then I'll keep doing this as long as they'll let me. When we return, Sarah checks out the Mitsubishi MU2. While they may be known better for building cars, TVs, or heavy equipment, Mitsubishi has been involved in the aerospace industry for a number of years. In recent history, the company has built F-15s and MH-60s under license for the Japanese Self-Defense Forces, as well as the 787 Dreamliner's wings, and is developing the Mitsubishi regional jet on its own. But Mitsubishi has also built aircraft for the general aviation market. The MU-2 is a twin turboprop aircraft built by Mitsubishi that has been used for a variety of different missions. Uh, the MU-2 was created in the 1960s uh, by Mitsubishi for the corporate market. Pat Cannon is the president of Turbine Aircraft Services. It was first displayed at the World's Fair in 1963. It was an instant hit with, the, uh, with aviators all over the world. So it became very popular very fast. Uh, the aircraft was manufactured to a military spec and a military tolerance and was originally built to be a turboprop. Unlike many other manufacturers who develop turboprops from their piston-driven airplanes, a piston-driven airplane, a derivative like uh, some of the other manufacturers, are simply that, they're derivatives. But the MU-2 was built to be the MU-2, was built to be a turbine-powered airplane. Well, this aircraft was built to incorporate high speed in cruise, short takeoff and landing distance, and a great deal of flexibility through the use of the turbine engines, which gave them range and power that they didn't have in previous aircraft. The MU-2 has a number of characteristics that make it unique among turboprop business aircraft. The aircraft is very fast. Depending on the model, it's capable of speeds of up to 310 knots or faster. That's only 50 knots shy of the original Cessna Citation business jet. On approach, the aircraft can fly as slow as 100 knots and land in less than 3,000 feet. To enable this wide envelope of performance, the aircraft was designed with a relatively small wing, only three feet longer than a 172, meaning less drag and more speed. At the same time, double-slotted Fowler flaps, similar to those seen in a commercial jet, were added. These massive flaps cover the entire rear portion of the MU-2's wing, and when fully deployed, add around 20% to the total wing area. Sarah had a chance to experience the MU-2's performance herself as she flew with Pat in his short-body MU-2. As a twin pilot herself, Sarah is used to flying in a pressurized light twin, the Cessna 340. At almost 3,500 pounds heavier when empty, the MU-2 is going to feel a little bit different than what she's used to. It is a lot heavier than the, uh, the Cessna 340 that I'm used to flying. It's definitely, I can feel the weight. It feels really sturdy under my hands. Yes, it does. It feels like a very substantial airplane under yeah. your hands. Perhaps one of the biggest differences with the MU-2 versus other aircraft is that the airplane does not have ailerons. The aircraft uses spoilers on top of the wing to control roll. This is not a characteristic that is exclusive to the MU-2. In fact, the B-52 Stratofortress also uses spoilers in place of ailerons to control roll. In the early design for this aircraft, it was decided to use spoilers for roll control for a couple of different reasons. One reason was that the spoiler is very efficient and it has some great flight and aerodynamic characteristics that ailerons don't have. Now, one thing I noticed you doing is that you are putting a little rudder in there, right? You're yeah. a conventional multi-engine pilot. With, an with a spoiler, you don't need to do that. Oh, uh, I... 
Remember that little yeah. thing called adverse aileron drag? Yeah, I do. Don't have it anymore. Okay. Hey, look at that. All right. Spoiler is a, a wonderful piece of equipment. Uh, it changes the shape of the lift on top of the wing. Okay. So what it does, it, it doesn't interfere at all in things like stall maneuvers. When you're doing a stall in an aileron equipped airplane, if you displace an aileron, you could deepen a stall on one wing. Right. With a spoiler, you can't do that. With a spoiler, you actually can change the shape of the lift on the top of the wing, and all of the wing is not stalled at the same time. Right. So you always have some roll control doing stalls in an airplane with a spoiler on top. Okay. You don't feel any difference in a spoiler over an, over an aileron. You can notice if you if you turn left, just go ahead and roll the airplane a little left. It flies just like an aileron yeah. equipped airplane. Exactly the same. Exactly the same. The center of mass is here, so we always rotate around our center of mass. Okay. From the outside, the MU-2 has its own very unique look. The aircraft's very round, almost Rubenesque body allows for a very roomy cabin, while the aircraft's high wing and short stance may remind people of a much larger cargo aircraft. Of course, an MU-2 is very distinctive on the ground. You, when you see one, you know it's an MU-2. The high wing, the tip tanks out on the end of the wings, that little short, fat look that the airplane sometimes has on the ground. People call it a mini C-130. So it has a distinctive look on, on the ground, and people will look at it and say, boy, it looks like it's going 300 miles an hour sitting right there on the ground. So it's very distinctive in that manner. Mitsubishi stopped producing new MU-2s in 1986. However, they've been extremely active in continuing to provide factory parts and service. As all of the aircraft out there are used, MU-2s can be found at very affordable prices for its category of aircraft. The aircraft's size, its rugged gear and ability to operate from rough strips, and its reliable turboprop engines make the aircraft well suited for a number of business uses. However, the aircraft's speed and maneuverability make it an airplane that you just might want to use for fun. Well, I think you feel like you're flying a Ferrari. Uh, when you're flying the short body aircraft like we flew last night, uh, a lot of people refer to, to it as their sports car. Uh, it is a wonderful airplane to fly. It's stable. Uh, it's a great instrument platform for shooting instrument approaches. It'll just, it'll get you where you want to go. It'll do it efficiently and very quietly and uh, very fast. So we've been buzzing along at 200 knots. We've only had about half the throttle pushed up there at 200 knots. That's amazing. Indicated. So if you pushed it up to 90% torque, we'd have been going 250 knots easily at this altitude. Yeah. The MU-2 is certainly unique in a lot of ways. Typically for aircraft similar to the MU-2 size and weight, you would only need a class rating, such as multi-engine, to fly the aircraft. A type rating or specific training on the aircraft would not usually be necessary. However, as the MU-2 is a much faster aircraft and has some unique flight controls, extra training is required by the FAA to fly the MU-2. If you look at airplanes in general, you have this category of airplanes that are called high-performance turbo-powered airplanes. Right. They can be turbo, turbo jets or they can be turbo props. Every one of those airplanes requires some kind of specialized training. It doesn't matter which one it is. Right. Uh, King Airs, uh, uh, Commanders, these airplanes all require some kind of specialized training. The question is whether or not people actually do train in them. So, for example, you, you with a Cessna 340 uh, twin-engine uh, rating could come out and buy an MU-2 and go fly it used to be able to do this right. without any training whatsoever. Really? No questions asked? That, that's correct. So that could get a pilot in trouble in any turbine-powered airplane. Of course. So there really isn't, and the, and the interesting thing, thing about this is that there really isn't any special training for the MU-2 necessarily, as much as it is that we have a good comprehensive training course with the special FAR right. that puts people in a common training program, one that has all of the same elements no matter where it's taught. To ensure that MU-2 pilots operate their aircraft safely, pilots are required to take part in training each year to stay current. Additionally, Mitsubishi has put a lot of effort into another program known as Pilot's Review of Proficiency, or PROP. Despite the fact that new aircraft are no longer being produced, this is part of their effort to ensure that the aircraft continues to be operated as it was designed to. As with any airplane, in the right hands and with the right training, the MU-2 can be a joy to fly. You notice you don't have to use any uh, rudder in there? It's amazing because I'm so used to I mean, I fly a Super Cub too, right? So I'm <laughs> banging on the rudder all the time, but I love it. It's, it's really stable. It's really, it's, it's just very smooth. I really like how smooth it is. Uh, it is a terrific airplane. Uh, it's my airplane of choice. I have a little over 10,000 hours in MU-2s, wow. and uh, I, I absolutely love this airplane. I fly my family 
and the family dog ever, <laughs> everywhere we go, and we just have a great time in it. Coming up, we head to Madison, Wisconsin, as the Air National Guard does a flyover at Road America. Don't be intimidated by air traffic control. ATC is there to help, and flight following is a great way to stay VFR and still have professionals there to help you along the way. The singing of the national anthem is an important part of marking the beginning of air shows and sporting events across the country. For air shows, the anthem is usually marked by a skydiver bringing in the flag with their landing on target ideally coming at the last moment. For outdoor events like races held at Elkhart Lake's Road America, a formation flyby is the perfect exclamation point at the end of the anthem. But how much work goes into making that five to 10 second flyby happen right on cue? To find out, we joined the 115th wing of the Wisconsin Air National Guard as they conducted a flyby for a NASCAR nationwide series race at Road America. Three, two, one, hack. 1125 Badger Flight, welcome. 2v2 TI, briefing will be unclassified. I actually haven't done uh, a led a flyby before. This will be the first one that I've led. I have uh, flown in a couple flybys where I've been on the wing. Leading the four-ship flyby will be Captain Mike Koob. Ready? So as a little kid, I always had an interest in flying. Built radio control airplanes through grade school. Started flying with a whole series of World War II Vietnam vet uh, aviators. Got a real big interest for military aviation and then decided to pursue that. So I got older. What's neat about the Air National Guard too is I concurrently work with SkyWest Airlines. So I'm a pilot with the airline in the civilian world and I have the opportunity to fly F-16s in the military on the side as well. So dual role and that's, uh, that's what's really unique about the Air National Guard and serving in that capacity. The Air National Guard is one of two reserve components of the U.S. Air Force. Operated by each state as part of their National Guard, Air Guard units across the United States operate nearly all of the aircraft of the regular U.S. Air Force, from transport aircraft to the B-2 stealth bomber. Well, the Air National Guard, it's uh, kind of a unique organization where we have a dual state and federal mission. For the federal mission, we obviously do homeland defense as one of our primary missions in the Air National Guard, especially when you talk about F-16s and the fighters, F-15s in the Air National Guard. The Homeland Defense mission obviously is pretty important to us since 2001, but even before that, the Air National Guard was poised with alert sites around the country protecting our borders. So that's a very unique federal mission that we do. In addition, we deploy whenever we're tasked overseas contingency operations, Afghanistan, Iraq, and other places like that. Statewide, what we do is we offer our unique skills and services, and as well as equipment, to people like the governor, for, for instance, search and rescue. While Captain Koob is a part-time member and came to the Air Guard originally as a civilian, there are full-time members of the Air National Guard and also individuals who have moved to the Air Guard from the regular Air Force. I am a former active duty person. I was in the active duty for 12 years. Uh, four years ago, I decided to make the transition to the Air National Guard, and a lot of it had to do with family, but a lot of it had to do with the tremendous respect I had for the Air National Guard. Flow out of the airspace, towards the racetrack, which would be about a 090 from steer point. For today's mission, Captain Koob's four ship will be doing more than simply flying over a racetrack. In fact, the flyover is a secondary objective. Their primary mission will be conducting air-to-air -air engagement or dogfight training. So quarter after one, what we'll do is we'll take off with our four ship. We'll go out to the airspace and practice a training mission today. It'll be 2v2, so two airplanes simulating red air. Uh, that is uh, enemy type tactic and then two air airplanes simulating blue air so myself and number two will be the blue air fighters and we'll go out there and we'll uh, fight a 2v2 two two two, uh, type intercept game plan so we'll complete that mission that'll take about an hour after that mission we'll head up uh, north and a little bit east there to the uh, to the flyby location and do the uh, flyby while the flyover is a secondary objective, the Badgers still view it as a very serious mission objective. To assist with timing on the ground, Major Ben Gerds is at Road America. Having someone on the ground at every flyby 
is imperative in that we have a time that we know we need to fly over. If that changes drastically due to TV schedule or the national anthem start time, it's going to be a very ill-timed flyby if it's up to a couple minutes off. So definitely important to have someone there on, with, on the ground with radio contact. An F-16 pilot himself, Major Gerds volunteered to be the man on the ground to coordinate the flyby. I've done multiple flybys in the past for the Green Bay Packers, uh, Badgers football, and other uh, events. Uh, what we do is uh, we take turns being on the ground or in the air for these events. Flying is always fun. I'm never going to pass up a flight, but uh, it's a great opportunity to be here on the ground at Elkhart Lake. Awesome facility, and it's been very fun to, to look around. Once the mission is fully briefed, Captain Koob's Badger flight step into their jets and prepare to take off. It's a huge honor to have the opportunity to fly a $30 million something airplane in, in my 20s. Uh, this opportunity is uh, it's fantastic. But also today when we taxi out, knowing that the crew chief, you put all that time into this airplane, making it airworthy, kind of releases you the keys to the jet for uh, our hour and a half sortie today. It's, the feeling's are a lot like uh, maybe when the first time dad lets you borrow the, the family car, you know, and take it out. Every time you get the chance to go fly a $30 million taxpayer airplane, it's, it's pretty awesome. As the four aircraft take off and the time on target is set, any changes come down to Major Gerds to communicate. Getting the exact timing of the flyby down is a careful balance. One of the things that makes it really hard to hit the exact time right at that exact moment is when the song starts, or if it starts early or starts late, that needs to be communicated to these guys. Also, we like to set up our system in the jet to have us there 15 seconds late, and then we make up the extra time by using afterburner as we fly over. We can't leave it in afterburner the whole time or we'd be supersonic when we went over the top of the uh, show center, which would be bad. So those are a couple of the factors that go into it. One of the ways that I can help these guys on the ground is by actually doing the mental calculations, converting local time into Zulu time. When the song starts late or early, I'll do the calculations. Uh, tell them exactly what time to punch into their system in the jet to be overhead so that they don't have to do that calculation while they're flying out there at four or five hundred miles an hour with three other guys three feet off their wing. As the anthem starts, Major Gerds gives a quick time update to the Badger flight. DOT 1934-22 in your system. The main straightaway at Road America is more than a mile long, with spectators spread out the entire length. Somebody along that mile is going to see the flyover either too early or too late. As the jets come inbound, the anthem is going a little quicker than expected, and it appears that the Badger flight will be off by a few seconds. While they appear to be a few seconds behind, the four ship hit their mark at exactly their time and target, and for the 115th, this was a mission accomplished. For Captain Koob and Major Gerds, the few seconds off in timing does not diminish the purpose of them being there. The flyover itself is a witness to, to those. As you listen to the anthem and you think of, uh, you think of the War of 1812, right? When Francis Scott Key's sitting there and he's watching the, some of the earliest Americans decide that it's worth fighting for, life, liberty, the pursuit of happiness, the things that we hold dear as Americans. And these early Americans stand up to fight and we still have that, and it's so, so alive in our society today, I think. We can, we can debate the reasons, uh, the pros and cons, or our, our current involvement with wars all over, and we can debate that. But I'd say when, when we fly over, it's a witness that we still have that spirit alive. And it's not, it's not so much me, it's the whole team that goes into to doing this. It's all the people who put these jets, get them ready for us. It's all the taxpayers who, who work hard, give their paychecks to Uncle Sam, so we have this opportunity to keep a good fleet of airplanes ready uh, for any involvement that we need worldwide. 